Before winter closes in on the Antarctic, Captain Cousteau lifts off Calypso's helicopter pad to evaluate the navigability of the fast-changing seas ahead. Soon, when the low skimming sun disappears completely, the seas will freeze solid for hundreds of miles offshore. During the short South Polar summer, Cousteau has been studying the waters and marine life of the frozen continent. Now he endeavors to prolong his investigations as long as possible, before the drifting pinnacles through which Calypso must travel are imprisoned in impassable pack ice. Below us, a colony of crab eater seals anticipate winter by fattening up on concentrations of krill, the basic food for both mammals and birds in these bountiful Antarctic seas. The baleen whales also feed on tons of krill that will be stored as energy in the form of oil and blubber. This reserve will be drawn upon as the whales migrate to warmer but less fertile waters to breed and raise their young. We return to Calypso over gigantic tabular icebergs. Some have measured up to a hundred miles in length. I am now convinced that we have very few days left before winter puts an icy lid on Antarctic waters. The channel northward is still open. The men of Calypso will now attempt to take advantage of fleeting summer days to pursue their investigations in northern waters which will be the last to become locked in ice. This is part four of Jacques Cousteau's expedition in the Antarctic, in which Calypso's mission to South Polar Oceans concludes in the hazardous waters of Hope Bay. En route to Hope Bay, Calypso travels north along the Antarctic Peninsula, picking her way through channels, islands, reefs, and icebergs. With the chill of advancing winter in the air, blue-eyed cormorants feed in the abundant sea and flock for mass migration to warmer waters. The cormorants gather within a cluster of islets that Cousteau discovers as a refuge for Antarctic wildlife. He calls it Port Calypso. 
Philippe Cousteau leads an expedition to a hidden cove in which helicopter reconnaissance has unexpectedly disclosed a small herd of fur seals. We are happy to find that the regal fur seals, plundered for their glossy, dense pelts to the point of extinction, seem to be making a comeback here. In this paradise, virtually inaccessible to man, the seals play and preen their foot-long whiskers. The discovery of the fur seals in their isolated rocky cove will provide a rare opportunity to film the sportive creatures both above and below the water. The fur seals are currently protected by the Antarctic Treaty. Now they are unafraid of man and their behavior is practically undisturbed by the presence of their fellow flippered visitors. For the fur seals, the sea is not the only arena for fun and games. There is also courtship on the rocks. A flirtatious young female pursues a handsome bull. She nips him on the neck and wins him by a whisker. We leave the fur seals, hoping that all nations will continue to honor the Antarctic Treaty and leave them to thrive. Suddenly, weakened by summer thaw streams, the face of a glacier begins to crumble. The channel ahead could soon be clogged by these falling mountains of ice. We must now escape to more open waters. In a few minutes, what were clear waters ahead turned into a field of drift ice pushed toward Calypso by erratic currents. We must maneuver carefully through deceptively small growlers. Our wooden hull is scraped as we encounter even larger ice blocks. Proceeding at about half a knot, Calypso bores on. The channel is now so packed, the ice blocks cannot be avoided. Our strong steel bow pushes an ice block that should not cause much trouble. But it has a protruding ice tongue hidden five feet below the water. We hit it.
The ice block bounces back, striking Calypso under the rear, where our vulnerable rudders and propellers are. We lower a TV camera to assess the extent of the damage. In the ship's mess hall, the TV monitor reveals that one of the two propellers is bent. Since one blade is bent backward and another forward, Philippe Cousteau believes the propeller may have been hit by two ice blocks. They have to proceed to the protection of Palmer Station and repair it there. The damaged propeller sets up dangerous vibrations at full speed, so we are obliged to travel at no more than five knots. With limited visibility, we come upon an uncharted hidden reef identified only by the waves created by the submerged rocks. You can trust no map here. We are not much better off than early navigators with our primitive charts. Calypso heads for shelter at Palmer Station, the nearby American base. All ships in the area, including Calypso, have been alerted to the plight of a solitary mariner lost for two months in Antarctic seas. Three days later, at Palmer Station, that saga of Dr. David Lewis ends. A launch helps him tie up to Calypso. Dr. Lewis has sailed from Australia in an attempt to circumnavigate Antarctica alone. But crashing waves capsized his 32-foot sloop, the Icebird, breaking its mast and knocking out his radio. Sea-soaked for two months in freezing temperatures, he has somehow survived. Messages uh, saying that uh, everybody was without news from you. Mm. So uh, every ship afloat in this area was alerted mm. and eager to find you. And when did you have your accident to the mast? Two months, 27th of November. What? You're navigating two months with that, that little mm. thing? 2,500 miles away. I got my fingers frostbitten when the boat turned over. Ah. And I had to get the water out. I lost their gloves. How are your fingers now? Much better. Oh, much goodness. better. They were just falling with the nails. And um, the nails are going to fall, uh, fall off? Or? They were falling. Mm. Yeah. I see. Via satellite. A belated Christmas message will be sent by Magnifax to Dr. Lewis's daughters, Vicky 10 and Susie 11. I miss you both so much. Hope you are not too worried. Was your Christmas nice? I shared mine with the little icebirds. I love my girls more than anything in the world. Daddy. Dr. Lewis is bewildered dubious about the space-age transmission of this message, so important to him. And uh, we are ready to transmit in uh, 10 seconds. Uh, Calypso, this is ARC. We got an excellent copy on this. Uh, very good. We'll send this on. Uh, very interesting about uh, Dr. David Lewis. We'll see you tomorrow at uh, 18.30 hours. Now on the way to the Weddell Sea, Calypso proceeds to the turbulent northern point of the Antarctic Peninsula, where a hummock of ice bobs, oscillating in resonance with a long swell. As Calypso turns due east through the narrow passage of the Antarctic Sound, an opening between obstructing icebergs is found. Here, storm-driven icebergs have destroyed many ships. Subdued light 
an atmosphere of slumbering threat as we approach our destination. The gateway to the now placid Weddell Sea. The Argentinians ruefully called it Esperanza, Hope Bay. Hope Bay, a narrow, deep submerged glacier valley at the entrance to the Weddell Sea. Philippe and the filming team are on their way to explore the ruins of an ice castle. The stranded iceberg is in a state of disintegration. Fierce winds and deep swells have created a confusion of crags and cored out caves, which the divers will explore. Philippe discovers that there is a tunnel leading down through the center of the iceberg. Passez-moi la caméra sous-marine, la neuf. Dorado enters a fretted arch through which raging seas have coursed and disappears into the catacombs. Then he reappears through another opening in the honeycombed ice. He has found that there are more tunnels large enough to dive through. This will be the first dive ever within an iceberg. Within the ice castle's dark dungeon, a tunnel leads the divers beneath the stranded iceberg. The fragile structure could collapse at any moment and hurl upon the divers tons of icy debris. The divers enter a maze of dazzling reflections and inviting passages. Soon apprehensions fade. The men cannot resist running their hands along the icy walls as they glide through the eerie sculpture. Their lights penetrate deep into the clear ice and reveal intimate secrets of the iceberg's past. Every storm, every winter and summer of the last 500,000 years, when the berg was part of a glacier, is etched in the now slowly melting crystal. The divers are drawn once more into the entrails of the iceberg itself, entering through the mouth of another cave. They find themselves within a crystal cell. A long descent through a tunnel leads to the seafloor. Now they prudently regroup to ascend together along the exterior of the ravaged iceberg.
As Captain Cousteau plans the work ahead, snow flurries signal a dramatic change in the weather at Hope Bay. The temperature of the sea and air are dropping. The men of Calypso will accelerate their dives to accomplish as much as they can before the onset of winter. Time out as the first real snowfall makes boys out of men. The beleaguered Bougaran takes evasive action to get even. February in the Antarctic, the end of the brief South Polar summer, and soon the beginning of nine months of winter. The men pursue their explorations. They do not suspect that this first snow of winter will soon turn into a fateful raging blizzard at Hope Bay. At Hope Bay, the men of Calypso intensify their exploratory operations before violent storms, freezing seas, and winter darkness close off the continent. Penguins are gathering at the edge of the sea because of the abrupt change of weather. These penguins are mostly Adelie juveniles, left behind by their parents, which have already left the rookeries to feed at sea. The adolescent offspring must soon migrate from the sterile shores to the ice floes, so that they too can find food in the sea during the long winter months ahead. Because of the basic simplicity of life cycles in the Antarctic, the behavior of animals can be more easily observed and interpreted. Young penguins under early winter conditions are good examples of adaptation to extreme environmental challenges. The bay is in the process of freezing. Some of the penguins have already settled on ice floes. The juveniles will stay at sea for four years, feeding underwater, using the floes as rafts. Then when they mature, they will return to the exact rookery of their birth to breed. Stimulated by the coming of winter, the penguins catch fat flakes of gently falling snow. Now the divers prepare to film the penguins' migration from the nearby rocky shoreline to the floating ice. Our divers wear completely watertight dry suits that are inflated to provide insulation in the frigid water. The penguin's protection against the extreme cold is his full dress suit of oily feathers. Physiologists are studying human adaptation to South Polar stresses. Much has been learned from the warm blooded penguins who can frolic for hours in freezing seas that would in minutes kill an unprotected man.
ice is forming on the underwater cameras. Philippe will film for as long as he is able. A crust of sea ice is forming over the divers. As the weather worsens along the shoreline, a young penguin triggers a general migration to the security of the ice flows. penguin can leap seven feet out of the water, but its landing isn't always perfect. They continue to come in bursts of speed up to 30 miles an hour. The young penguins dart past our divers, impelled to reach the flows. A late comer settles in with his fellow apprentice sailors. They will often ride such ice flows during their four years at sea. The snow is still falling when Philippe terminates the dive. The inflated dry suit may add buoyancy in the water, but it's cumbersome on land. The men prepare to return to Calypso. For a last fling in the water, Dominique Soumillon has blown up his suit to most impressive proportions. Philippe is not to be outdone. Soumillon takes to the water unencumbered by tanks and the Antarctic Sea becomes a swimming hole. Like an inflated bullfrog, Philippe follows. It is a toss-up as to which bullfrog will become king of this pond. Aboard Calypso, via satellites, Cousteau is in contact with NASA. Uh, did you ask me about the weather conditions we are now? Uh, well, um, according to uh, the satellite's photographs that we have at our eyes, and according to what I see through my window, uh, they coincide pretty well. Very sad, gray weather with moderate wind. And now we are beginning to have a growing sea, and there is a fairly strong depression coming from the west, and that is probably going to hit us tomorrow. Cutting an open lane through the slushy sea, the divers return to Calypso as the snow continues to fall. After conferring with NASA, I realized that although now the water is calm and the wind is quiet, things will be changing rapidly. The wind may blow down from the glacier mountains at any moment. Already the barometer has dropped and the seas are freezing around us. Perhaps we have stayed too long. Cousteau must hurry from the storm area, 
but Calypso is on a long anchor, and before it can be raised, a fierce wind hits Hope Bay. The wind, screaming down off glaciers, rising in five minutes from zero to 65 knots, drives huge ice blocks out of the bay and toward Calypso. A jagged ice block is on a collision course with Calypso. A sickening shudder tells us we are hit. Another large ice mass, many times the weight of our ship, slams into our stern. A cavalry of ice boulders scrape along our double-planked wooden hull. It is a futile fight against an overwhelming adversary. And by the time the wind drives most of the ice away from us and out to sea, we fear we are gravely injured. To assess the damage below, Falco has been winched down by the diving saucer crane. For Hope Bay is still too rough to put down a dive ladder. Falco, having examined the rudders and propellers, is winched up in a bosun's chair. Cousteau and all on board anxiously await his report. Falco reports that not only is the starboard propeller badly bent, but the shaft of the port propeller is broken. It is very serious, he says. The shaft cannot be repaired. And the blizzard at Hope Bay has just begun. Philippe Cousteau leads an emergency dive beneath the stern of injured Calypso. The seas of Hope Bay are still turbulent. The men chance a dive ladder for their descent. The damage wrought by the colliding ice is alarming. The shaft of the port propeller has been knocked out of its socket. We have completely lost the use of this propeller. The divers must fasten the shaft so that it does not ram into our port rudder and disable us completely. Through hand signals relayed by divers to Paul Zuena on the winch, the propeller shaft is secured by a strong tackle. Although the starboard propeller has also been damaged, the divers dare not tarry to attempt to repair it. The barometer is going down, and the blizzard at Hope Bay worsening. Calypso must lift anchor. The narrow mouth of the bay is blocked by an armada of fast-drifting icebergs. There is no way out. 
All hatches are battened down, including that of our diving saucer. The blizzard begins to turn day into night. We would be lost without radar. With visibility zero in waters too deep to anchor, I am obliged to circle my ship slowly in a bay 500 yards wide. The wind rises to hurricane velocity over 18 knots. Calypso is covered with freezing spray. We circle in the blizzard for three days and three nights on our single bent propeller. Finally, venturing into the sky, a seabird. At last, the storm is abating. After spending three days on the bridge, Captain Cousteau gets his first opportunity to inspect his ship. estimate that Calypso is burdened with at least 30 tons of ice. That makes her top heavy. She is not so far from capsizing, especially if the wind and sea rise against her again. Cousteau informs NASA, Calypso is still in Hope Bay. We are prisoners here. The damage to Calypso is severe. We are obliged to organize our return as soon as possible. Calypso digs out. A hole in the hull, two feet above the water line, is temporarily repaired. The anchor chains are freed. Gradually liberated from her icy prison, Calypso still faces her most perilous journey. Bougueron and I study ice conditions revealed by satellite photos. Our immediate objective is King George Island to obtain assistance for our crossing of the Drake Passage. First, Calypso must get out of Hope Bay through the narrow, ice-clogged Antarctic Sound. Our reconnaissance helicopter goes ahead to show us the way out. It is to lead us through the ice toward the low sun over the sea. Calypso crawls laboriously along. After a blizzard, the wind often changes 180 degrees and resumes blowing with great force. To avoid this cyclonic storm center, Cousteau chooses night travel through the Antarctic Sound. The helicopter returns to lead them through the obstruction immediately ahead. Oh, ce 
c'est de savoir si la barrière que nous avons devant nous, là, actuellement, si en allant vers l'ouest, à quelle distance on peut la contourner à toi Calypso, pursued by winter, is led by the helicopter to the ice-free waters that lead to King George Island. Wounded Calypso must now face the challenge of recrossing the treacherous Drake Passage to the tip of South America. By radio, Cousteau confers with Bougaron, Calypso's skipper, who has gone to the Chilean station at King George for meteorological information before they attempt the crossing. Bougouin reports they should sail immediately. An unusual lull between storms may be expected in the Drake Passage, in which there is normally a storm every three days. Cousteau states that this information is confirmed by photos from American satellites. It will take disabled Calypso four and a half days to cross. Cousteau must take advantage of the opportunity right away. A Chilean gunboat will accompany them. They will go. OK, bon, eh bien, on va lancer le moteur, là. Calypso begins her journey across the Drake Passage. Out of the early morning mist, her Chilean escort, the Yelcho, appears. Growling along at five knots on her single bent propeller, Calypso enters the waters feared by seamen as the roughest in the world. In addition to the Yale show, NASA and NOAA satellites, as well as the U.S. Navy's Fleet Weather Service, are keeping constant watch on our damaged ship. If our vibrating propeller shaft should break, leaving our ship dead in the water during the next storm, we would need the Yale show to tow us to safety. The sudden appearance of dolphins off our bow tells us that we are at last nearing land. The traditional friends of the sailor have joined our escort. South America, Captain Cousteau leaves Calypso in a Zodiac to pay a visit to the Chilean gunboat. To the Chileans from the French oceanographer, it is a warm salute to the hands across the sea spirit, which transcends all national barriers. Cousteau boards the Yelcho to express his appreciation to its crew and its captain. Lieutenant Commander Carrasco welcomes Captain Cousteau. After repairs, Calypso will soon be on her way home. 
The new information we gathered in joint research with NASA will require long analysis. Calypso has successfully probed the most dangerous of waters. Assaulted by icebergs and besieged by savage storms, she has survived. In her greatest and most challenging adventure, limping but unvanquished, Calypso has come through. On board Calypso, we had come to Antarctic Oceans for the first full-scale diving expedition there. With dry suits, diving saucer, and helicopter, we spent hundreds of hours observing and filming animal behavior from the surface down to 1,000 feet. We studied the productivity of these frigid seas and were distressed to find few living whales due to centuries of indiscriminate slaughter. We did find the waters to be the most biologically rich in the world. And above, a transparent atmosphere that reminded me of that of my childhood when I could see the Alps from the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Our discovery of a thriving hidden colony of fur seals proved once more to us that nature generously responds to well-implemented protective measures. Our constant companions were the penguins. They revealed to us their long, swift flights under the sea and their courage when they successfully confronted their predators. We had sought the unknown and rediscovered what we once knew, harmony and purity on our planet. May the last continent explored by man be the first continent not plundered by man. Out of the midnight of misdeeds against nature, may there come a dawning of respect and love for the wild creatures and secret places of the last virgin land on Earth, Antarctica. <laughs>